Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. I'll just give it a few seconds to let everybody join the room. So um, I would like to welcome you to this BFB working group on linking humanitarian cash assistance and social protection webinar. Um, my name is Kate O'Donnell and I'm the new coordinator of the SPFB Working Group um, and I'm delighted to welcome you here today to this webinar which is focusing on the opportunities and challenges to link humanitarian cash assistance and social protection in the Horn of Africa and the Sahel. Um, so just a little bit about the, the group, as many of you may know, the SPFB Working Group is a multi-agency platform that brings together humanitarian and social protection practitioners um, on a common platform to engage in dialogue, strengthen coordination and foster knowledge generation and learning, really with the ultimate view to strengthening the humanitarian and development nexus. And the group is co-led by the IFRC, UNICEF and FCDO. And these webinars are really one of the ways that the group uh, fulfills those objectives. So today, uh, our focus today um, is on the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. Um, and given the protracted nature of the issues in these two regions, uh, humanitarian responses will not be enough to tackle the long-term structural issues. So strong social protection systems will be key to long-term poverty reduction and stability. However, the intensity of the current food and nutrition crises, as well as many other issues, means that humanitarian responses are also essential. Therefore, it is integral that these humanitarian programs are linked to scale, are linked to the scale up of social protection in these regions. So some of the questions we hope to explore today are like, how is this linking being done in these regions? Is it being done? What are the barriers to linking? What tools and approaches have been used to better link humanitarian cash and social protection? Um, and we really hope to kind of share lessons learned and, and um, across a diverse set of actors working in the humanitarian development and the research fields. Um, and we really have an excellent lineup of speakers who can provide those different perspectives on these issues from, from different angles. Um, and then finally for me, just regarding some housekeeping, we would really hope and welcome you to engage in the webinar and ask questions and we would ask you to put all your questions in the Q&A box please um, and if you have any comments or want to share resources or any other ideas you can use the chat function for that but please put your questions into the Q&A um, and now without further ado um, I would like to hand over to our moderator today who is Professor Rachel Sabatis wheeler uh, Rachel is a prof professorial fellow at the Institute of Development Studies and a co-director of the Center for Social Protection. She has a wide range of experience in areas of rural development, poverty analysis, migration, um, and social protection. And currently, Rachel is the co-executive director of the Better Assistance in Crisis Research Program, and therefore is the ideal person to take us through this discussion uh, and really give us some food for thought. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate, and welcome everybody. So um, yes, I'm Rachel from the Institute of Development Studies, and we've got three amazing speakers lined up. Um, we're going to hear from Carlos Estevez um, to begin with, who is an economist with the FAO. You can see his bio there. And um, <clears throat> Carlos is going to tell us a bit, set up the context uh, of it about what's happening particularly in the Horn and the Sahel regions in terms of current food insecurity, the drought situation, and um, issues of protracted crises. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do with um, the Better Assistance in Crisis program and how important it is to link humanitarian and social protection response. And then we're going to have experiences from the field. We're going to hear from Helene Pasquier, and she is from Action Against Hunger. And she's going to be giving us a humanitarian perspective on linking humanitarian cash and social protection in the Sahel. And then we'll hear from Mira Saidi, and she is a social protection specialist at the World Bank. And she will be giving a development, in comparison, a development perspective on scaling up social protection uh, and how to link to humanitarian efforts in the Sahel also. 
So I'm going to be moderating um, this discussion. We're just going to go straight through the speakers. As I've said, the lineup will be. And um, we'll try and keep to time. And then we'll have 15 minutes or for Q&A at the end. So over to you, Carlos. Carlos, you're on mute, so you may, might want to unmute yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Sorry for that. Um, good afternoon, uh, good morning to all my colleagues and all the participants to this webinar. Let me now share my screen. Presentation. Carlos, I'm just going to mention, I don't know if Fernanda wants, there's a strange sort of tapping sound on your computer. But go ahead and, and I'll let you know if, it, if, it, if we can't work with it, okay? Sure. Just give me a tutorial of this. So as uh, Rachel mentioned, I am going to present an overview of the current situation of the food security and nutrition in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. Again, my name is Carlos Tevez. I work as an economist at the FAO Global Information and Early Warning System. Our mandate is to monitor food markets and analyze uh, continuously the security situation across the globe in order to inform governments and other international agencies and bodies for decision making. Carlos, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, Fernandez, but maybe your volume's too high. There's a really strange sound coming out. Is your cell phone too close to the computer, maybe? This. Um, is your solving PC or are you using speakers? Some, someone has, Paula has posted that. I'm sorry, is the sound okay now? It's very crackly. <clears throat> what I could do is I could present first, sort of what I was doing and then come back to you. Yes, yeah, sure. Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, sorry about that, but um, yeah, if you just um, try and figure it out and we'll see if it works after me. <clears throat> okay, so I guess I've got, I've got the floor a little early, but I'm, so when um, Kate introduced me, I'm a, currently the co-director of a big program called BASIC that is funded by FCDO. And it means better assistance in crisis and it's specifically looking at the interactions and linkages and the space that we're able to think about the humanitarian and social protection overlaps and harmonization or not. And where um, this can be improved, particularly in situations of protracted crises. So we're looking at situations of recurrent climate shock, protracted displacement and protracted conflict. So anyway, I just wanted to set the scene a little bit about why is it important for us to even think about linking social protection and humanitarian cash responses. And I think we can all agree that the current challenges, the, the fact that we've got a lot of data and statistics that tell us that the number and the intensity of crises are increasing. Crises are often very protracted. Um, and when, when we say protracted, we mean recipients of humanitarian aid is re are receiving cash or year on year for more than five years. In fact, over 80% of humanitarian aid is allocated to crises of over five years. So, uh, and because of this, we get an increasing use of cash assistance to respond um, to these protracted crises by drawing lessons from the social protection sector. Um, so if you think if you think about the traditional silos and spaces of, of humanitarian and social protection, humanitarian response is really originally what we could think of the old style humanitarian response is designed to provide a short term support for a sudden acute.
acute crisis. However, we know that the humanitarian system is spending substantial resources on chronic or long-term crises. And social protection, on the other hand, originally, it's been in the last 20 years, we've seen it providing regular predictable safety nets to chronic poverty, caseloads of chronic vulnerability to help them better manage their risks and livelihood. So there's a massive overlap there, isn't there? Because if you think about if humanitarian year on year is providing to a similar beneficiary or caseload of people, in fact, that's a space that social protection also should potentially be filling. So there's this continuum of support. We talk about continuums, nexuses, complementary support, where we think ideally we want as much integration, harmonization, alignment between these different types of contexts so that we get a continuum of support to help those who are most vulnerable and poor in a range of situations. Now, so there's some real advantages to think about when we think we want to link these sectors, these activities. And so the linkages and the advantages around value for money, potentially cost, you know, why duplicate, for example, vulnerability analyses or targeting or data collection? So why, why can't we think about platforms for complementarities? So for example, targeting, is there, can we use a common platform for our, for our MIS systems or can we use common IDs um, so that we can ensure coverage is as widespread as possible and we're not people aren't sort of double dipping. Um, can we think about how better to streamline data collection vulnerability analysis? Can we think about how to prepare uh, a joint formulation of preparedness plans? Uh, or accountability systems. I mean, anyone who knows about social protection, we can think about a whole system of social protection. It's like almost like a value chain of social, a delivery chain of social protection. Where are the points in that delivery chain that we can actually get some real synergies going? Okay, so there's some real, really big advantages to linking the systems. But of course, there's also massive challenges to delivering humanitarian support through social protection systems or vice versa. And so I'm just going to point out a few of those challenges that probably people will talk about in concrete terms in a minute. So first of all, if we think about this type and the scale of the shock or the crisis, I mean, clearly when we say, oh, there's a crisis, there's, that could cover a whole range of different things. There's a huge variety of settings and contexts. Could it be a sudden onset shock? Could be a tsunami or an earthquake? Could it be... Um, a slow, predictable shot, like a drought, you know it might be coming every two years. Is it conflict related? Is it climate related? And it matters a lot, the nature of the shock and the type of fragility um, in terms of how and to what extent humanitarian cash and social protection support can actually build synergies. So for example, in a situation of conflict, a key consideration might be is it even feasible or appropriate to try and link these two sectors? Is the state actually involved in the conflict? Are we actually trying to build a national system or are we going to do some parallel provision? Where there's refugees, for example, is the state, is the national state willing to accept refugees within its own system or only uh, allow certain areas where we might coordinate? So these are all really important points when we're thinking about linkages. Um, other things that are to do with the maturity of a social protection system. So any country or even a region of a country you go to will have a different type of social protection landscape. Perhaps you're in a relatively stable context and um, the government is the main provider, it might not be the main funder. In other places, you might have a completely shattered infrastructure and the capacity is very low. So you might rely first on a humanitarian initial support, but then how do you build on different types of um, activities or targeting or data collection so that you can establish systems later. These are challenges. Other challenges are to do with political economy factors. We know that our different institutions might hold on to our specific mandates. We might prefer a targeting method over another. The World Bank, for example, might prefer this type of targeting method. UNICEF might prefer this. You know, are we willing to come out of our silos to try and link up 
WFP might prefer another type of data than an LSMS type data. These are all challenges. And um, the, fact, the, the last challenge I'll mention is to do with populations, reaching populations at the margins, excluded or IDP type populations, refugee populations. How do we reach those populations? Um, and how do we think about linkages between the social protection and humanitarian provision? So these are all thoughts I'm throwing up to kind of frame um, what we're going to be talking about, particularly in the context of the Horn and Sahel and food security crises. Um, and I guess the last point I will make is that in the work I'm doing in the basic program, you know, we are trying desperately to think about um, solutions, interesting ways and useful ways we can link up in different contexts, the humanitarian social protection, but also recognizing that sometimes there is a place for pure humanitarian provision um, as an immediate response to a crisis. So that's me. Carlos, I'm going to come back to you now and see if, if your speakers are okay. Hello, Rachel. Uh, you hey hear me? Yeah, that is better. Is it clear now? Yeah, it's much clearer. It's good. Okay. Then I am going to present, uh, share my screen to see the presentation. Do you also see it now? Yes. I can see it. Good. Perfect. And thank you very much. I'm sorry for the inconvenience before. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to all my colleagues and participants of this uh, webinar. As Rachel said, I am presenting an overview of the current food security and nutrition situation in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. Again, I work as an economist at the Global Information and Early Warning System. Our mandate is to monitor food markets and analyze continuously the food security situation across the globe in order to inform governments and other international agencies and bodies for food uh, for decision making on food policies and the food security uh, interventions. I would like to start my presentation uh, with the global trends on food insecurity in the past six years, according to the a recently released a global report on food crisis, the estimates uh, numbers of people in uh, acute food insecurity have been increasing steadily since 2016 and reached a maximum uh, record, a record high of 193 million people in 2021. This is a 70% increase compared to the levels in 2018. The main drivers for this deterioration are um, intensifying conflicts, weather extremes, and economic shocks that have been exacerbated since 2020 by the COVID-19 pandemic, the containment measures, and the ripple effects that the pandemic has had over uh, the global economy and glo global food supply chains. Potential risks in 2022 are the unfavorable weather outlook, persistent conflicts and the unfolding effects of the war in Ukraine on international trade, commodity prices, and also macroeconomic uh, conditions in most vulnerable countries. I will come back to this at the end of the presentation. In 2022, in the Sahel, food security and nutrition have been characterized by a major uh, deterioration. About 12.7 million people uh, are uh, estimated to face acute food insecurity during the lean season period. This is between June and August this year. And this includes 1.4 million people uh, classified as an emergency. Um, this also represents a 45% increase on a yearly basis and is more than double the five-year average. The main drivers for this deterioration are worsening conflicts in the Central Sahel, this uh, in the region known as the Liptako Gurma uh, region, bordering uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, and in the Lake Chad Basin, which is also in the border areas of Niger, Chad, and northeastern Nigeria. These conflicts have caused a large scale displacement and 2.9 million people were estimated to be internally displaced, while 1.1 million people were refugees in the five countries. 
uh, also reflecting uh, unfavorable weather conditions, mainly um, a poor and a poorly distributed rainy season in 2021, characterized by dry spells and also flood events. Cereal production was reduced in uh, 2021 and was below the five-year average. Uh, the declines in production was more uh, severe in the Niger, where the cereal production was estimated 40% below the average, and in Mauritania, where coarse grains production was 30% below the average. Um, this, has, uh, this was reflected by an uh, increase of cereal prices, main, uh, mainly staple cereals, which has been increasing since 2021, and in the first quarter of 2022, reached record high levels, notably in Mali and Burkina Faso, reflecting below average market supplies. Um, another factor that has contributed to the high prices in the subregion is uh, reduced uh, trade flows that have been the result of uh, export bans in several of the countries, and uh, notably in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Chad, but also in Cote d'Ivoire and Argelia, that are key trade partners uh, for the subregion. Um, also, uh, the economic sanctions imposed by ECOWAS on Mali, persisting banditry across borders, and COVID-19 me containment measures have uh, reduced the, uh, the flows of commodities. Finally, more than 5.9 million children are uh, estimated to face acute malnutrition in 2022. This is a 22% increase from 2021. In the Horn of Africa, conditions in 2022 uh, have also been deteriorating. An estimated of uh, 27.5 million people are, face, uh, are estimated to face uh, acute food insecurity. This is a nearly threefold increase compared to the levels in 2020, uh, mostly associated to the prolonged and severe drought that the subregion is experiencing. Other uh, drivers are compounding this situation are war in northern Ethiopia, mostly concentrated in Tigray, but also in parts of Amara and Afar regions, and persisting conflict in Somalia. Overall, this has caused um, uh, also large-scale displacement, and 7.2 million people were internally displaced in the Horn of Africa, while 1.4 million were refugees. Um, in 2021, due to the four consecutive droughts, cereal production was below the average and uh, declined in Kenya by 15% and in Somalia by 40%. In conflict-affected northern Ethiopia, uh, cereal production was also estimated at reduced levels. This has resulted in very high price, uh, prices of staple cereals, which reached record or near record levels in the first quarter of uh, 2022, notably in Ethiopia and Somalia. Finally, more than 6.1 million children uh, were estimated to face acute malnutrition in 2021, a 6% increase from 2020. Um, forward looking, uh, the outlook for 2020, we have potential risks to agriculture and food security in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. Uh, the weather outlook in the Sahel indicates uh, a high likelihood of above average rainfall in, uh, in the five countries, which can benefit um, crop production, but it's also increasing the likelihood of floods between August and September. In the Horn of Africa, uh, there is uh, expectations of a fifth consecutive drought forecast uh, uh, for 2022, likely to result in shortfalls of cereal and livestock production, compounding a very dire sit food situation in the region. Also persisting conflicts are likely to keep continuing uh, the disturbances to agricultural livelihoods in the, the second part of the year, causing further displacement and curtailing agricultural production. Finally, the effects of the war on uh, international prices of food, fertilizers, and fuel are expected to have uh, severe effects on access to food and availability of food. So in countries that are high that have a higher high reliance on cereal imports, uh, 
cost for imports might increase. Uh, and these countries are mainly Mauritania and Somalia, among others, where more than 50% of the cereal requirements are, um, are originated from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, this might also cause higher production and transportation costs and expecting to driving up uh, domestic prices. Of concern, the, there is the limited access of fertilizers by high, food price, by high fertilizer prices, which can have an adverse effect on plantings and yields of the current main crops of 2022. Recapitulating and as a conclusion, I would like to uh, remember that in the Sahel, 12.7 million people are at risk and in the Horn of Africa, 27.5 million people are at risk of facing food, uh, acute food insecurity if not humanitarian actions are scaled up. Um, this will be all from my side. I am happy to reply to questions in the QA session, but also via email in my email address, or you can also go to the uh, JUICE uh, website. Thank you very much, and over to you. Thanks, Carlos. That was um, kept to time, and we heard it very clearly. So we're now going to hear um, from experiences from the field. We're going to go to Helene, who's going to talk um, from her perspective about linking humanitarian cash and social protection. Thank you, Helene. You need to yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And uh, first, thanks to the organizer for the invitation. So we are very pleased to have uh, the opportunity to present our experience on linking humanitarian cash assistance and social protection in the context of Sahel. As we can see in the next slide, so my presentation will cover the, the following points. So first I will do a quick introduction on who we are as Action Against Hunger and what is our vision of social protection. Then I will present two different field exper experience that illustrate how do we engage in the agenda on linking CVA to social protection. And finally, I will conclude the presentation with a few reflection to, to open the discussion. So who we are, could you please move to the next slide, thanks. So as Action Against Hunger, we are a global humanitarian organization committed to tackle both uh, causes and consequences of hunger and undernutrition. Our technical expertise is in the sector of food security and livelihood, wash, nutrition, health, and disaster risk management. You can see here in the map all the countries of Sahel where we do currently have field operation. Um, humanitarian cash assistance represents an important volume of our operation. In 2020, in Sahel countries, uh, we delivered a total volume of more than 31 million of euros to CVA. Also in Sahel, we are strongly involved in the Cadre Monizé, the equivalent of the IPC for West Africa. And we have set up a regional pastoral uh, early warning system named SIG Sahel. Uh, you have the link here if you are interested in. And uh, just we wanted to mention it as a early warning system are also an important element for the discussion we are having today. So now uh, we would like to present briefly what is our vision of social protection as humanitarian actor. So for us, of course, uh, social protection is a crucial policy to achieve a world free from hunger. And based on our experience on social protection in the different parts of the world, uh, we have elaborated a social protection plan for 21-25. And this plan is basically a call for action to address core issues on social protection. And uh, we have identified uh, five critical changes necessary to expand social protection today to end poverty and hunger tomorrow. So these uh, five critical changes are the following one. So the first one is related to the effort that should be made for the expansion of social protection floor over the life cycle. The second is focus on the need to have social protection schemes capable to cover all people in need. The third one is around building social protection system that are shock responsive. The first one is on how social protection should be properly implemented to promote good nutrition and gender equality. 
And finally, the fifth element of our theory of change is to remind that social protection policy should be evidence-based. So if you are also interested, we can share in the chat our social protection plan. So after this introduction, yeah, we are now going to present our field experience in Sahel. So um, the first example uh, we propose to analyze is uh, related to the implementation of regular cash assistance program during, during the hunger gap, what we call the seasonal safety nets. So just to give a bit of, of background, after the 2012 food crisis, there has been a, a huge increase um, in terms of use of humanitarian cash transfer to better address seasonal needs in Sahel. So first, humanitarian actors have improved uh, coordination among themselves to harmonize approaches and tools, and little by little more dialogue with national protection uh, National protection and social protection actors, sorry, have been uh, established. So, so far, uh, discussion has been around uh, targeting, uh, unified social registry, and value transfer. So, what has been achieved? I will not go into the detail of each country, but just to mention some achievements. Uh, on targeting, harmonized questionnaire have been developed for joint targeting in, in several countries, combining the proximity test, the PMT, and household economy approach, ATM methodologies. Uh, value transfer is usually aligned between social and seasonal safety net program, even if the timing is different, because we know that uh, social safety net program are uh, being supposed to be run during all the year, while um, seasonal safety net program only cover the younger gap period. Uh, progress has, has been made as well on the creation of social registry uh, with beneficiaries of seasonal safety net being included in the registry in, in many countries. Uh, we have also the case of Mauritania, where from this year we will use a common platform that will allow to track, uh, we receive humanitarian cash transfer and we will receive a social safety net. However, uh, we also want to take the opportunity of that presentation to highlight some improvements that are needed and a few aspects that need further attention. So regarding targeting, um, we have to say that measuring vulnerabilities uh, remain a huge challenge and uh, making sure that we target the most vulnerable is still a central uh, question for us. Uh, we think that uh, targeting strategies should be well designed, being robust, but at the same time, not too sophisticated. And of course, targeting should be well justified. On social registries, there is a crucial need to have updated social registry, and the exclusion error is a clear risk. Uh, we have also to mention about data protection issues, as a data protection problem has already happened in some context. Um, regarding transfer value and the process to harmonize transfer value among humanitarian and social protection actors takes time. And uh, we can see, uh, for example, that uh, in the current context of price increase inside that has been mentioned also by Carlos, uh, while um, quick decision making is required to, uh, to adjust transfer value, this is not really happening at the moment. Um, apart from that, we, we wanted also to mention a few activities that we have included in our programming to complement our seasonal safety net project. So the first point that is mentioned here is on supporting uh, cash recipients to access national ID cards to facilitate their future integration into national social protection program even if uh, administrative procedures are quite complicated on the ground. The second point is on complementing humanitarian cash transfer with other productive activities and combine it is or it as well with the provision of SHM services and uh, particular wash and health. Uh, activities that we implement to promote livelihood, for example, our village saving loan association, the transfer of productive assets or psychosocial uh, support. However, um, we must uh, recognize that more efforts should be put on learning and building evidence uh, really to better inform the design of national uh, social protection program in the future. And last point uh, we wanted to highlight related to that example is the experience from Senegal, uh, where we have contributed to the development of the ARC replica insurance that is covering risk of drought. Uh, this initiative has contributed to improve joint preparedness planning between NGO and the government. Uh, we are currently one of the main implementing partners of the ARC replica, and uh, this initiative is, is contributing at some point to progressively doing shock responsive social protection in the country. 
So that's it for the first example we wanted to, to present. So the second example we would like to bring for the today's discussion is the work we have done in Nigeria to contribute to the setup of national uh, social safety net programs. The, the process uh, started in 2013 uh, with a research program named CGDP. Uh, which uh, stands for Child uh, Development Grant Program in the Jigawa Northern State. Uh, this program was then uh, replicated in Borno and Yobe states, so in emergency context in area where there was no social protection system in place. Uh, we had the chance to benefit uh, multi-year and consecutive funding. And we want to highlight this point as we consider this has contributed uh, to the success of the, of the approach. So this intervention has been implemented in area uh, the most severely affected by conflict in Nigeria. So we think it is also a good example on how to develop safety net schemes in conflict affected area. Even if, of course, uh, we had to face challenges in terms of access and some uh, suspension of the program happened due to security situation. So this program, uh, having a gender sensitivity, has uh, contributed to establish the foundation of a model of safety net targeting pregnant women from pregnancy until the two years of the child. So we have positive uh, impact that uh, we can uh, report, and uh, there are many related uh, to women livelihood activity, the um, household food availability across all season, on child diet diversity, and also on health, especially in terms of child immunization. So from the beginning of the project, uh, close collaboration with the government and uh, state level authorities has been established. And uh, for that, of course, a needs assessment was uh, conducted at the beginning of the intervention. And one specific objective of the project was to contribute to develop capacities of the government staff uh, to design a state social protection policy. Uh, that's a good news. It has been recently approved in the state of Jigawa, where we first uh, started the, the implementation. So now to conclude our presentation, if you can move to the next slide, thanks. So here, just the main message we, we wanted to share to, to open the discussion. So globally, our feeling is that things are moving slowly in the soil uh, when talking about linking humanitarian cash transfer and social protection. Because if you worked in Sahel a few years ago on that issue, you will, prefer, you will probably find only a few changes as for now which is really uh, disappointing, according to us, knowing the, the level of existing gaps and needs in the region. That is true that uh, also regarding coordination, coordination uh, mechanism exists, but it should go beyond exchanging information. And uh, really, we think a more strategic dialogue is needed to ensure smooth decision making. And of course, here, yeah, the, the question of leadership is uh, crucial. Uh, another point we wanted to highlight is the need for local civil society to participate in the discussion. Um, we have recently conducted a study in uh, three countries, uh, two in West Africa, where we have asked local women organization and fem feminist association what their views and requests uh, regarding social protection are. And according to us, uh, it is important to remind that uh, civil society organization in Sahel are, are competent. Um, through our presentation, we also wanted to pass on the message that a humanitarian actor can bring some expertise for the implementation of social protection and that we can provide technical support also for the administration of social protection schemes, uh, like um, tools for CVA delivery, case management, etc. And finally, even if this webinar is focused on humanitarian cash transfer, uh, we think it is key to repeat that social protection goes beyond cash and that as multiple needs and vulnerability are existing in Sahel, we should have a more holistic approach of uh, social protection. So I hope I was not too long. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. And I think that now I, I have to hand it over to Mira from the, from the World Bank. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ellen. I will just share my screen. Um, okay. 
I hope everybody can see the screen. Yes, but it is there. Empty. We go. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So thank you everybody for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending wherever you are. So I will be talking, um, I will be presenting some of the initial findings of a study that we have conducted um, through the Sahel Adaptive Social Protection and Trust Fund um, that we recruited and um, contracted OPM to help us do the study across the six countries in the Sahel that we work in. Um, and from that, from OPM, it was led by Karen Seifert, Corinna Cradler, Sophie Batas, and from the World Bank side, it was myself and Ugo Gentilini um, working on this. So thank you to OPM. And I know that Car um, Corinna and Sophie are connected, so thank you as well to them. So this is basically presenting some of the initial findings findings we have. We are still working on finalizing the study, um, but we thought it could be interesting and bring a lot of perspective to um, this webinar. So just to present, first of all, the Sahel Adaptive Social Protection Trust Fund um, is a multi-donor trust fund at the World Bank under the Social Protection Unit in West Africa. And we have FCDO, BMZ, um, Danida, IFD, who support this multi-donor trust fund. And the objective of this trust fund is to try and lay the foundations of adaptive social protection systems in the Sahel. So back in you know, 2013, I would say, 2011, there was practically no safety nets, um, at least government-led national safety net systems. Today, we have at least established you know, national, as nascent as they are, nascent systems. And now we're also working with them across different building blocks to help them become more flexible and be able to convert, um, to flex and um, adapt and scale up in times of shock, whether vertically or horizontally. Obviously, what we said at the, you know, what was presented at the beginning by Rachel is that humanitarian systems are not sufficient uh, to be able to respond to shocks, but neither are in the Sahel national systems today. And so that is why the, the issue of coordination and convergence between the two is necessary to be able to actually reach all the needs. We need to be able to work together. So the objective of the study was really to find where are the most um, efficient and effective connecting points for alignment? Where can we connect better? what are the barriers and enablers? So what is preventing us from connecting more? What are enablers that we're not leveraging sufficiently yet to be able to connect better? And so to provide strategic and policy and operational reflections on where are the low hanging fruits? What can we do more on? Um, what should we be doing? And we kind of look at the all the actors. So we're not just looking at kind of people on the ground, but we look at on the field, what we can do better, um, better in terms of our organizations at the donor level. So it's really kind of looking at a holistic um, view. This is just to present the analytical framework that was used. And this analytical framework was developed by Karen Seifert, um, Gentiline, and other authors. And so convergence is not only the purpose is to say convergence is not only an either or, it's not a yes, no, it's a spectrum. So you can go from having fully parallel systems that don't interact at all to fully converged ones um, and working through the national system. And in between, you can have some alignment and some piggybacking. So I think this is really important to have that it's a spectrum, it's not like a yes or no. And then we looked at, um, in the six countries, we looked basically where do our systems fall across 16 different elements of the value chain, of the trans, you know, of the, of the transfer delivery chain. So we look at the legal framework, we look at targeting, um, delivery mechanisms and payment conditionality, uh, and where do we fall? And obviously it's a mixed bag in the Sahel. So as I said, we looked at six country case studies, we focused on cash programs, um, and we tried to focus comparing um, the national systems, and then we selected other humanitarian programs that have at least 5,000 households um, that provide cash assistance. We mostly focused on the seasonal drought response, so the lean season, um, and in Chad, we did focus, however, on the refugee support um, between humanitarians and the national system, and in Niger on the COVID-19 response. So that is just to give you an idea of who we compared to and how it was done. So it was really very thorough and heavy um, in-depth case studies that have led to these findings. So as I said, there's a mixed picture of convergence today. Um, just to mention that convergence is not always a goal in itself. So sometimes convergence is not ideal for certain situations. When government capacity is very you know, weak, potentially using the same government unit by different actors is going to actually impede um, reaching more people. So that, for example, is not always, we don't want it to be a goal in itself at any cost. Convergence is not one directional. We have seen in this case studies that sometimes there has been more convergence, but that can be reversed, particularly if you have conflict um, and changing circumstances, for example, uh, in Mali. Currently, there's not an overall strong convergence in the region, 
despite having opportunities for more convergence. So in countries like Senegal, um, which have more or less a relatively strong national system, we find that convergence is not where it should be given the strength of the system. So there's more that we can do. Um, as we know in Sahel, there are compelling strategic reasons for which we need to do more convergence. Um, and we just need to find a way, how do we translate that into action? How do we get there? Uh, given the limited resources that both humanitarians and the national systems have, this should oblige um, partners and actors to converge together because there could be a lot of economies of scale, more effective delivery um, if we do um, converge together. So this is kind of a work in progress in terms of how we're framing our enablers and barriers because again, enablers and barriers are not either or. They're not just an enabler or just a barrier, but they work in different ways. So we have some elements that are purely enablers, some that are bi-directional, which means depending on how they are leveraged or exercised, they can either be uh, positive towards convergence or actually impede convergence. Some elements are enablers if they're present, but actually their absence is a barrier. Um, and then finally, we have some elements which are strong barriers. I won't go through all of these. I just wanted to cherry pick a few to just you know, present what does that mean for us? Um, and we find that being able to, we always often discuss that we should converge more, but being able to discuss what is preventing us and putting a name to those um, factors is always gonna be important to help us actually get somewhere. So just quickly, a quick enabler is a history of collaboration. We've seen in countries where there has been more collaboration historically. Today, they are more converged on some elements. So we have seen this in Mauritania that um, there has been a long repeated interaction for cross-learning, um, cross co collaborative learning. Um, and that has led to Mauritania being one of the countries in which we have greater convergence. The lack of collaboration um, or the lack of historical collaboration does is not a barrier, right? We can always start today. But just to keep in mind, it is a long process. It's not going to happen overnight. Some ways of work uh, working that are bi-directional, donors. Donors can either help... Um, you know, promote convergence or actually be a barrier to work convergence. Through our Sahel Adaptive Social Protection Program, for example, donors have been um, encouraging us to work clo more closely with WFP and UNICEF. And we have kind of set up at our level a joint working group together on many elements um, to see how we can converge better. Donors, however, are not always going to um, be uh, promoting convergence because they have their own risk appetites, they have their own strategic um, strategic interests that sometimes don't necessarily align with the national system. So if donors want to cover certain specific areas um, in conflict, they want to, you know, they're more risk of, um, averse in conflict. So that's going to sometimes not be in line with what the national systems do. And so donors can be both ways. Um, what is very important, government leadership is something that is very much needed. In its absence, it's a barrier to convergence. So stable governments with clear visions, clear policies, with more or less relatively well-established systems are a great enabler towards convergence. And we see that in Mauritania and Senegal. When you have a stable system that is well-defined, humanitarian actors are better able to say, okay, we have something that we can converge in and that we have something that we can leverage or piggyback on. We see the opposite, for example, in Chad and Burkina Faso, which have less um, established systems, which have also conflict and insecurity to deal with. Partners have less um, of an angle to piggyback on or leverage. And so government leadership is very strong. Government leadership, however, can also potentially go both ways, depending on if the government, what the government is promoting um, in terms of a system and in terms of safety nets. The same goes for institutions. Institutions are very important. Um, but oftentimes what we see in the region is that they are very fragmented with overlapped uh, mandates. And so, you know, having the lack of a very clear mandate and very well established um, and converged institutional system at the government level means that humanitarian partners are also working with different overlapping um, agencies. There's high turnover. There's a lot of changes in the people. And so there's a lot of um, the lack of a very stable, present institutional clear setup makes it very hard for humanitarian and development actors to know who to interact with. It means there's a lot of starting over um, and inability to be able to converge on the same messaging with the same part um, counterparts within government. Finally, um, I think a barrier that we all know about and we all discuss, but it's not 
we don't often discuss it actually very clearly in the field um, and in our meetings, but it is very important. And I think Rachel obviously did mention this, it's this political economy and institutional interest. Obviously government systems and humanitarians have different potential institutional interests. Um, and these don't always align to be able to have greater convergence. I think there's a lot of competition between agencies um, and there's an aspect of where adopting government systems or strengthening government systems can mean less control and less funding potentially. So this is not necessarily to kind of point blame, it's just a very clear barrier. Um, and this requires a lot, a lot of starting discussions and it's not a technical solution, right? We can't just come with a technical solution to this problem. So having discussed the barriers and the enablers, Mira, Mira, yes. can we just spend one more minute? Is that okay? Yes, this was my last slide, so oh, I wasn't okay. going to go into it, but this was to say that at least in the Sahel, um, this might not be representative of all regions, but in the Sahel, we found across these different elements that we discussed at the beginning, um, and I also think that Ellen mentioned um, in terms of where we're converging and not on, there's elements that are not contentious that we can easily converge more on and elements that are more contentious. And the contentiousness also has to do with what barrier is preventing us or what enabler is present for these, right? So as we know, payment system, the barrier of political economy or institutional interest doesn't really affect it. But when it comes to transfer values and targeting, this is very much linked to our institutional interests and to our objectives as government systems versus humanitarian systems. Um, and so these require different paths or different strategies to be able to tackle them and get more at. And there are low hanging fruits that we want to present that both humanitarians and government systems can converge more on. So thank you very much. Um, that was the presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you to the other presenters. We have about 10 minutes um, for discussion. So if you could put your uh, videos on. Um, wonderful. So we have a few questions, just three in the chat box, the Q&A box. Um, please do put more in, but a couple I'll start with, um, I'll direct to our panelists that kind of feed straight off the back of what Mira was talking about, about contentious, issues when it comes to coordination and particularly Fiona raised a question on targeting where you know and we know that that's really contentious um, even amongst humanitarians depending on there's a kind of path dependency about the type of targeting methods that different organizations like to use anyway the question from Fiona is where does targeting of humanitarian assistance meet the push for progressive universal social protection in general in social protection systems. So how does that, is there a conflict or a tension there? So that's one question I'm gonna come to um, you guys to respond to. The other one um, from Peter was around transfer values. Do transfer values only refer to cash transfers or do they also, are you talking about sort of in-kind values as well when we, we compare those things? And then a third question, for, and I'll come to all of you, you can decide which ones you're going to respond to, was what are the biggest programs that are addressing the largest needs in Sahel and the Horn of Africa at the moment? What would we say they are? So um, why don't I come to Mira first, given that you were the last one to speak, and we'll go back around. Uh, thank you. So I also see a question specifically on the OPM double, um, World Bank study. So I will tackle that first, and uh, if that's okay. Um, so the question is from Sigrid. Um, she's wondering if we've looked at the role of national response plans can play to ensure minimum standards of coherence. Yes, this is something that um, we did look at um, in detail and national response plans and their the way they're developed, the coordination, uh, the groups that work around them um, and how abided to they are not is varies across countries and also depends on the strength of the government um, and the fact that there's different institutions which are mandated to actually deal with social protection versus um, shock response versus disaster risk management. So this comes into the institutional playground and um, it also comes into the role of the government. So we have looked at them um, and we will, uh, this will be more apparent when we do share the study. So um, they do play a common role and they do provide minimum standards. It depends who's converging on them or not. Um, so in terms of the biggest programs that are addressing the large needs in the Sahel, 
I think it diverts by country. In some countries, you have large programs. In Senegal, you have the government, which is very large um, and able to cover a lot of people. In Mauritania, we have great uh, convergence in terms of leveraging humanitarians and uh, governments. And I wouldn't be able to say which um, are the biggest humanitarian programs, unfortunately, that cover those needs. Um, but And cash transfers, we did put on, in our study look only at actual cash and not at in-kind transfers. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mira. Helene. Would you like to come back on any of those questions? Yeah, maybe I can address the question on the transfer value. So in in the example I presented, it was only considering the, the seasonal safety net is the uh, it means that the the transfer value for the seasonal safety net normally is equivalent to the quantity of cash that is distributed to the to the social safety net programs. Then we can add a complementary activity like, uh, as it was mentioned in, in the question, like uh, um, a voucher for agricultural inputs, it will be, uh, it will complement that and that uh, cash transfer. And maybe one comment on that, because it's also a challenge that we have in many countries that usually the value transfer is only considering food needs. I mean, a few countries have done the, um, the MEB calculation uh, included other needs, but in many countries it's only included food needs, and it's also it's also a challenge that and some dis more discussion on it in on that. Yeah, to address maybe that question. Great, Carlos. Did you want to add anything? I can come in as well after you, but go ahead. Yes, to reply about the biggest programs addressing the larger needs in the Sahel, I can uh, speak uh, on some of the uh, interventions that uh, FAO has been doing in the sub-region, mostly uh, a support to the off-season crops uh, after a severe deterioration of crop and livestock production in 2021. So there's been an emergency response to that in order to support small scale, small scale farmers with seeds and other tools uh, to boost the production in the off -season, season and help them to prepare for the upcoming main season. Uh, and also FAO is engaged with uh, some uh, cash transfers programs, mostly in Niger, I can recall. There is a cash for work program for households that are engaging in pastoral and agricultural activities uh, for the building of uh, barriers that uh, allow to protect tray, uh, crops and livestock from uh, fires that were also present in um, last uh, year's season. And in general terms, FAO advocates for countries to maintain the trade open. Uh, there has been an increase of uh, protectionist measures within the countries, uh, which have an impact on uh, food prices. And uh, we as FAO always uh, have been advocating for maintaining trade open. So there is a free flow of food commodities that ensure like a, a good provision of food markets. Thank you. Okay, um, we've got a Nupur has um, posted something in the chat box. She's not able to put it into the Q&A. So I'm just going to read it out. I um, really like the way the webinar has gone. We hear the term maturity of systems a lot in the context of social protection, but tend to assume that humanitarian assistance systems are mature. Are there any common parameters that can be used to assess the maturity of both? And if they exist, how often are they actually used to assess humanitarian system maturity? So yeah, great question. Um, I, I've done a bit of work on the social protection side of this and actually within our work at BASIC at the moment, we are trying to map out where different countries sit in terms of the context of fragility and crisis and the social protection system maturity, but you're right. Um, the humanitarian system maturity, whatever that is, I probably hasn't been figured in and, and factored in much into this. So that's an important point. Does anyone have a comment on that? Anyone want to add anything to that? 
or everyone's staying quiet? Sure. Oh, just to, I mean, I agree. That's a good question on humanitarian assistance because we also focus a lot on the national systems. And in terms of national systems, we have at the World Bank developed a methodology to try and assess the maturity. So when we use, when I use the word nascent, that's based on this methodology um, that we call the stress test tool to see the ability, at least for the adaptiveness of the system, how adaptive is the social protection system. Um, and we do look into whether there's connecting points with humanitarians to leverage. But it would be interesting to understand, maybe, I don't know if Elaine has more thoughts on how do you assess maturity? How is it measured that humanitarian systems are um, mature or not? Yeah, I think that's that's a good question. I think first the commitment we, we make as a humanitarian actor is also to, to consider and to analyze the social protection system that we are not doing the question for ourselves but with the with the ccd with the collaborative cash delivery network we have uh, developed an operational framework to 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 look at how can we engage with uh, with social protection system and the different step of the of the process there will one is dedicated as well to 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 analyze our own capacity and our own added value so i think it would be kind of at that Step that we will look also at the at our own capacity you know, to I think that's but that's that's a good question yeah <laughs> good, good question Nupur. um I guess there's an assumption I was just reflecting quickly that humanitarian systems don't mature and that's a horrible terrible assumption but I think there is that assumption because often you think okay humanitarians quick in quick out they don't really care about the long term which is obviously ridiculous um I'm going to carry this on for a few more minutes because I have the right to, um, but we will close in just a few minutes. Um, one question, some work that I've been doing on the productive safety net in Ethiopia, I was working with IFBRI and we used data to compare transfer values across the productive safety net um, standard sort of chronic poverty transfer versus humanitarian food assistance. And we did actually um, have to convert the values of the food and the oil and the pulses into a cash value so that we could make that comparison. So if, if you're interested, I think it was Peter in that, um, you could email me and I'll send you that work. But it is, it is very interesting because even if you say, okay, they're, they're equivalent or not, there's so many other things going on to do with say, conditions around public works that um, beneficiaries say, well, actually, if I can change onto humanitarian, response i'm not going to have to do that public work for a while so there's this kind of bizarre behavioral strategies going on um which is super interesting um let me just see there's a couple more questions we'll just take um julie um i don't know if it's a question but i'm going to read it we've just had the inception report for a piece of work looking the response times in humanitarian and initial findings are that the CVA focus response is fairly mature, established. And what is currently holding up larger scale response is that there's not been large scale funding flows yet. Okay, so all super interesting. I think we are going to have to stop. Um, one more comment from Sigrid, the last comment. I wonder if we could somehow stop to stress too much alignment or not between systems. The key issue being if we can cover needs in a timely and quality way to populations and needs without doing harm using whatever funding stream and system we can. Yes, also good. I guess even to do that, though, we would have to have a good idea of who's doing what to make sure we've got um, coordination, but good. Right, I'm going to have to bring it to an end. Kate, I don't know if you wanted to have a final word. Yeah, just to say thank you all very much. And uh, it's as always, these the real meat of the conversation comes out just at the end and these really interesting questions. But maybe we can carry this conversation on. We will have more webinars uh, throughout the year. And um, you can also reach out to this VFB group if you have other ideas for conversations or podcasts or collaborations. So, so keep in touch. And thank you so much to all the speakers. It was super interesting. And thank you, Rachel, for, for moderating. Thank you, everyone.